Thank you very much indeed, and welcome to the Scottish Parliament. My name is Ken McIntosh, I'm the uh, presiding officer, and it's my real pleasure to uh, welcome you to this, the 2018 Festival of Politics. Uh, it's, an, uh, it's our 14th annual event, and it's a chance for us to uh, engage and to open the doors of Parliament, your Parliament, and to invite you in and ask you not just to, to listen uh, to politicians, but hopefully to offer your opinions to inspire and to engage with us. Uh, and uh, for those of you uh, who are minded to do so, we are actually broadcasting this live on um, Facebook, but those who are minded to do so, um, please tweet in or uh, Facebook on hashtag FOP2018. That's Festival of Politics, hashtag, you're nodding as if you know what that means there, hashtag <laughs> FOP2018. Now, in, in politics, we often talk about um, you know, the big players in politics as being the, the beasts of the parliamentary jungle. Uh, now, given that uh, our guest this evening's um, affectionate nickname is Tarzan, I'm, I'm not sure he's so much a big beast as actually lord of that jungle, uh, but I'm delighted that we're kicking off our festival this year with Lord Michael Heseltine, uh, the Right Honourable, as our main guest. And if I may give a little biography before we start, uh, the son of a Welsh colonel, Lord Heseltine was born in Swansea, educated at Oxford, where he studied philosophy, politics, and economics. And prior to politics, Michael Heseltine established what would become the now multi-million pound Haymarket Media Group. His stellar political career began serving under Edward Heath as a junior minister in the early 1970s, before joining Margaret Thatcher's cabinet in 1979 to become the advocate for regeneration following the Brixton and Liverpool Toxteth riots of 1981. Posts as Secretary of State for Environment and Defence led to roles as First Secretary of State and Deputy Prime Minister and President of the Board of Trade in the government of John Major. Lord Heseltine has been a member of the House of Lords since July 2001, when he received a life peerage. And since then, he has continued to cause ripples and storms in the political world with his comments on the Brexit referendum. A long-time supporter of the Euro and a Remainer, Lord Heseltine was let go from a number of governmental advisory roles in 2017 after rebelling over the Article 50 legislation in the House of Lords. Earlier this year, he is quoted as saying, we have turned ourselves from the fastest growing to the slowest growing economy in Europe and we have made a complete horlicks of the Irish border. He is of the opinion that the matter must return to Parliament and possibly a referendum or general election. Lord Heseltine is married to Anne with three children and nine grandchildren and out with politics Lord Heseltine devotes much of his time to continuing to renovate the 70 acres of grounds surrounding his Thenford house where among its ponds and 13,000 varieties of plants, there is a massive bust of Lenin rescued from the former Soviet Union at the end of the Cold War, or so I'm assured. So I'm delighted to introduce the Right Honourable Lord Michael Heseltine. So if I may, may begin, and we're going to uh, open this to questions. So at any point, if you wish to ask a question or make a point, just put up your hand or catch my eye and I'll bring you in. But if I can, uh, before turning to contemporary matters, I wonder if I might start just at the beginning. And in your autobiography, uh, which I was pleased to read, uh, you obviously had a very, talk of a very comfortable, very secure early childhood, but you didn't particularly enjoy uh, moving or going to boarding school at Shrewsbury. Is that right? Or why was that? Well, actually, the first experience, I was in boarding school for the first time in Northern Ireland um, during the war. My father was stationed there. And uh, that was, I liked that. And then I was sent to another boarding school when my father moved uh, from Northern Ireland. And I ran away. Um, uh, we plotted uh, the whole form. I, I think I played a role in organizing the whole form of going to run away. 
And um, anyway, the great afternoon came, and only two of us were up for it. So we did a whip round. Every penny that any boy had got, we collected, because we were the pioneers who needed to finance this exploit. And we, we, we made a manful job of it, and we got about a mile away from the school. We were doing extremely well, so we, did, we got to the main road to Swansea, and we summed the lift. It was the headmaster. <laughs> My parents took me away, and I then went to another school, which I loved, and uh, then after that, Shrewsbury. And that didn't work. There was no escape from it. Looking at my CV at the end of my time at Shrewsbury, I was a washout. I would achieved absolutely zilch. And I, I, I have to be frank, I thought that was a rather harsh judgment. Um, and, and I suppose you could argue I spent the last 70 years trying to prove that it was a harsh judgment. Well, the... It's probably fair to say that um, in your biography, again, you talk about going to Oxford University and particularly becoming uh, president of the Oxford Union, and that was really the formative uh, shaping of your political career. Where, was that where your politics came from, or were the seeds of your politics already planted before you went to Oxford? I got a letter from someone who taught me maths at the age of seven, who said, oh, I always knew you'd become a politician. Uh, and at Shrewsbury, I did speak in the debating society, but uh, those are sort of, you know, acorns that perhaps were planted, but uh, I had no knowledge of that. And I do remember very vividly, as I sit here now, I can see it, the day I joined the Conservative Party, and it was in October of 1951, uh, the beginning of the election campaign of that year, and I was walking down one of the main streets of Swansea to meet friends for coffee, and I saw this hoarding on the other side of the road, Henry Kirby, Conservative candidate for Swansea West. Uh, I crossed the road and said, can I help? And 10 days later, I went up to Oxford, and my first day in the university, I joined the University Conservative Association, the City of Oxford Conservative Association, and the Oxford Union. Well, you, that, that, I mean, that demonstrates beyond peradventure that, that something in me was heading for politics. And you, you actually, although you, uh, your first experience of electing, uh, being elected to office was the president of the union, you ended up having to stay on an extra term at uh, university to achieve that, is that right? Yes, um, my course was a three-year course. And uh, in the summer term of the third year, I was elected as president, and the, I had to stay for an extra term in order to fulfill that. It was not without precedent, but uh, it was unusual. I, I like the fact that you, uh, <clears throat> the main base of your campaign was uh, turning the basement into a nightclub, and that was how you... Is that right? Have you got the books? Yes, but, but, yeah. but I think it, uh, there's a lesson in this. Now, in, in my view, in life, there are two sorts of people, and it's a dramatic overgeneralization. There are the retrenchers and there are the advancers. And if, if, there's, if there's a debate or a discussion, a choice, people divide into those who say, be careful, watch it, cut back. We're over-trading in business terms. Cut back to the, get rid of some people you know, reduce the commitment, withdraw, look down. I am not one of those. I'm on the other side of the argument. You've got a problem, sort it, go for it. And so you go back to the Oxford Union. We had falling membership, and um, so the, the argument was cut the expenditure. I said no. We've got falling membership because we're not attractive to enough undergraduates. We're going to change that. And we're going to have a better restaurant facility. We're going to have closed circuit television, which was a technological revolution of the time. We're going to turn the coal cellars into a nightclub. And we'll build the membership. And I led that campaign. And it was triumphant. Um, and uh, I got elected president. <laughs> um, uh, we, did, we did, just to give you a feel for it, the restaurant was four-course lunch for two and sixpence and a five-course dinner for three and sixpence. And every, well, on each of those menus, there was always a fish course. And one day I said to the chef, chef, this is very interesting. I read your menus, and I take part in them all the time. We have sole, we have halibut, we have place, we have brill, we have salmon, and all that. But then I look at the bills, it's always cod. <laughs> ah, he said, president, 
It's how you carve it. <laughs> right. Uh, I'll remember that now. You, um, you touched there about your approach to business. And the key, although you, you're, you're clearly your um, political interests were already alive at that stage, uh, you actively pursued a career, first in property and then uh, in, in publishing. And that was very important to you politically in later years. It, it gave you the, the independence to, for example, to be a backbencher after you walked out of cabinet in the 80s and to uh, support yourself during, I think, what you called the wilderness years. Did that whole period uh, of this period of your early life, um, did it influence you politically in terms of uh, being an interventionist politician about uh, your attitude to trade unions, to privatisation and so on? Well, I think there was a form, if I can slightly, uh, I come back to your question, but there is a very important, to me, moment in that period of my life. And it, basically, I got a degree at Oxford, and I, I was going to be a chartered accountant. And basically, with a degree, you had to do another three years, and the going rate for someone in that situation was three pounds a week. Uh, the firm to which I went wanted to attract graduates, and so they decided to punt, and they offered seven pounds a week, which is what I earned when I left Oxford in 1951. And my peer group of graduates at that time were earning 12 to, 15, 12 to 13 pounds a week. So I was only halfway able to afford what uh, my peer group of friends could afford. But I had a thousand pounds which my grandparents, I had a post office savings book, and there it was over 15 years, three and six, two and tuppence, 10 shillings, whatever it was, 1,000 pounds. So I said, that's fine, uh, seven pounds a week, 1,000 pounds over three years, 300 a year, six pounds a week, six plus the seven, 13 pounds, the equal spending power of my peer group. And then the magic moment, inexplicable, unpredictable, but I won't have a thousand pounds. So I found another friend who had a thousand pounds and we bought a boarding house and that had 11 rooms. We occupied two, sublet the other nine, and we lived like kings. <laughs> and a year and a half later, we sold it for double what we'd paid for it. I was on the property ladder and I was uh, beginning to understand the entrepreneurial opportunities of independence, and I had 2,000 pounds. You see, you lived like kings. It was built up of a tube station, I think. You had to... Oh, well, no, that was the next step. We, with the, with the, the doubled money from the boarding house, we bought a, 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 a 40... The, the boarding house had 11 rooms. We bought a 44-bedroom <laughs> hotel. Oh, my God. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, I was working in the, uh, in the city as an article clerk and then coming back with a paintbrush and all that sort of stuff. But this hotel had one characteristic which was uh, very noticeable. It was over the central line tube station, tube. And uh, it was, of course, perfectly safe, quite a long way down. But every 10 minutes... <laughs> and the trick was, you had to get the customer into the hotel and signed up <laughs> before the whole building started going up and down. Uh, anyway, we sold that for quite a profit as well. And then, and then you went from, from property into publishing, and that's... Uh, another uh, luck, yeah. another piece of luck. I was standing at the... Telephone exchange. Yes, we had telephone exchanges in those days, you know, plugs in for the rooms. And uh, the phone went, and it was a friend of mine from Oxford who said, Michael, I've bought a business, and uh, uh, I'd like your advice. I said, fine, I'll get a cab. And I got in the cab, and he showed me this business, and it consisted of a booklet which was called Oxford University, What's What? And basically, it was a two and sixpenny book for undergraduates coming up to university and it listed all the things and all the times and all the addresses of all the diversions that were available, the cinemas, the restaurants and all that sort of stuff. Tucked into the back of it was a loose 
insert called the Directory of Opportunities for Graduates. And it consisted of 16 pages of display advertising. Shell, the greatest company in the world, will uh, employ graduates. Uh, BP, even better careers. Uh, Rolls-Royce, this is where you want to work. 40 pounds, 16 pages of advertising. And I said to Clive, I said, this is madness. No undergraduate coming up here for fresh, as a freshman is going to be trying to work out their careers in three years' time. What you should do, I said, is to take this idea and give it away free of charge to every last year undergraduate in the country. He said, oh, I like that idea. Why don't you join me? I was in publishing. And the revenue went from the year in which I suggested the change from 16,000 pounds to 64,000 pounds the next year. Now, 64,000, you probably got to multiply it by 30 to get a feel for today's money values. I was in publishing. And one thing led on, property on the one hand, publishing on the other. And today it is the Haymarket Publishing Group. And, and you maintain that throughout your parliamentary career, you, you tried to juggle them both at one stage, but then you had to sort of step back, is that right? Well, I had wonderful colleagues. And when I left um, to become a minister, of course, you have to d distance yourself from the operations of your business. And, uh, but I had uh, three colleagues who ran it in my absence very successfully. So while this was going on, um, you hadn't obviously lost interest, far from it, in pursuing a political career. And um, you first stood, or you first successfully stood for Tavistock in 1966. Oh, that was the first seat. The first, first seat. candidature was Gower, Gower in South, in South Wales. 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 Labour, safe, safe Labour seat. Yes. Uh, and then the marginal Labour seat of Coventry North. And then 1965, I was selected for Tavistock, a Tory seat in the West Country. Gower was the one where you went along to heckle an iron revenue, is that oh, right? One of the great moments of my life. Um, <laughs> I, I, the, if you fight a, a, a safe Labour seat, um, you believe you're going to win it. You, I, I know it's mad, I know you should keep your feet on the ground, but you, all, you, the, all your supporters say, oh, we've not had a fight like this, you're the guy who's going to do it. I heard in the pub last night they're all coming your way. All this complete rubbish, but that's what you hear. Anyway, no one came near my meetings. There were no meetings. There were no conservatives in the mining valleys of South Wales. Um, uh, but um, uh, so uh, uh, one night, one day, I saw this um, advertisement in the South Wales Evening Post, the Labour Party of South Wales, Elysium Cinema, 10 o'clock, Sunday the 10th of October. The Right Honourable Anaren Bevan one of the giants of the day, will address the Labour Party. Well, they wouldn't come to my meetings, <laughs> so I'll go to theirs. In the dark, in the rain, serried ranks of the Labour Party, third balcony of the Elysium Cinema Swansea. Lights go down, the Labour members of Parliament come in with the giant in the middle, and Nye Bevan got up to introduce Di Mort, Labour Member of Parliament for Swansea West, Di Williams, Labour Member of Parliament for Swansea East, and here we have the candidate for Gar, Ifa Davis. Whereupon, from the third balcony, the back of this Elizabeth, Elizabeth Elysium Cinema Swansea, a voice was heard, you have both the candidates for Gower here tonight. <laughs> And Nye Bevan crouched over the microphone. Ah, he said, I hear the voice of an Englishman. <laughs> <laughs> and that is how, in the never had it's a good election campaign of 1959, I turned a Labour majority of 17,641 into a Labour majority of 25,900. <laughs> <laughs> But you, you didn't let that put you off, and uh, you were elected for, for Tavistock, and then in the, uh, under Edward Heath, in the, well, this was a Harold Wilson government, under Edward Heath, 1970s administration, he brought you into his administration as a junior minister. Yes, in environment. 
in family. What do you remember of that? Because looking back now, this was a time when, um, this, this was obviously the time when Britain joined the common market, but it, just reading your book, you, Europe didn't seem to be as divisive an issue then, perhaps as it is now. It was more a time of industrial discontent, of the oil price rising and so on. Ah, well, you have to go, it, 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 certainly Europe was divisive, but nothing like as divisive. And you have then to have an understanding of European history. You have to know of the Franco-Prussian War, of the First World War, of the Second World War, and the enormous determination of the men and women of the prisoner of war camps and the resistance movements under that simple, simple dynamic, it must never happen again. That's where the European movement came from. It was a political movement to stop a thousand years in which generation after generation of Scottish people, of British people, were sent to die on the continent of Europe. The first manifestation was the Schumann Plan, which was to take supranational control of the three great war-making industries, iron, coal, and steel. We didn't join. Following that, there was the European Community, which led to the Treaty of Rome, which, of course, we didn't sign. And that was a political decision to bring supranational partnership, shared sovereignty, to this warring continent of ours. In my lifetime, my Oxford career, the three concentric circles of Commonwealth, the special relationship with America, and our friendship with Europe were the faith and the philosophy in which my Oxford life fructified. Um, so, Nothing has changed. We have preserved peace in Europe since 1945, an unprecedented period. We have shared sovereignty on a scale without human experience. We have got rid of the fascists, got rid of the colonels from Greece. We are 28 parliamentary democracies living in peace. Yes. Endless fudges, endless compromises, endry argument, but you have that here in Scotland. You have it in every local authority. You have it in every parish. You have it in every family. The issue is how do you resolve these matters? By killing each other or by dialogue? Dialogue is more boring, but it is a better way to do it. And so that faith, which every prime minister in my party has told me about, argued for, created a vision of, has been the backdrop in which my faith in a shared sovereignty with Europe has become a central feature of my political instinct and judgment. Now, nobody died in the internal Conservative wars, but Edward Heath was followed by Mrs Thatcher, which did mark a shift. You didn't vote for Mrs Thatcher for leader. You had misgivings even from the start, I believe, about her leadership, but she appointed you to her cabinet. Yes, well, she wanted to sack me. Uh, two, just before we leave it, you, just so you may not come back to it, Margaret shared more sovereignty in Europe than any prime minister in the history of this country in the single European Act. But she wasn't instinctively a European. She didn't trust them, didn't like them. The French were devious and the Germans were dangerous. But nevertheless, she, she faced with the reality, looking at the reincarnation of the common agricultural policy, which we didn't join, with the single market, where she felt that the French and Germans would fix the rules in our absence if we didn't join, she signed. And that was the biggest sharing of sovereignty in the history of this nation. So, but go back now to Margaret herself. Um, I, I, I didn't get on well with her. Um, and uh, that's nothing, no big deal, you know. You're colleagues, you're not friends. And um, so she wanted to sack me. She thought of me as 
one of the Ted Heath wets, I think, or, or interventions. I don't really know what she thought, but she, she wanted to sack me. It all appeared in The Economist. Peter Walker had to go, Paul Shannon had to go, and I had to go. But unfortunately for this, they did go. But unfortunately, the day the axe was to fall, I was by this time a front bench spokesman opposing Ed, uh, Wedgwood Ben and, and some of his industrial nationalization proposals. And the, 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 when she came to call in the three who were going, one of her colleagues said, uh, Leader, we have a bit of a problem here because at two o'clock you are appearing on a platform with Heseltine in front of 2,000 small business people in Westminster Hall. And then he's opening for the opposition against Wedgwood Ben's nationalization of aircraft and shipbuilding legislation. But you can sack him, we could get someone to stand in. But she didn't. And then I made the first of those party conference speeches. And then I was unsackable. So I survived. And um, it, it, people misunderstand. I made the point about colleagues, not friends. But Margaret then put me into the toughest, most difficult, most exposed jobs that she had to deal with. Who was it who had to sell the council houses? Me. Who was it who had to take on CND and the nuclear disarmers? Me. And so, although there was no personal relationship of the sort that you can, you can have in politics, but the collegiate relationship worked perfectly well. And I mean, I could go on and give you many examples of how she um, actually praised what I was doing. But she promoted me, this is the important point, from being Housing Environment Secretary in 79 to Defence Secretary at the, the second big electoral issue in the second general election. Mm -hmm. Before we get on to that, just as... As Environment Secretary, you were given responsibility for leading on regeneration. I mentioned it earlier, this is following the, the race riots of 81, which were a very, uh, very difficult time for the country and I think for the government in particular. Do you see your own efforts then? Is that, do you look back on that as one of your biggest successes, your, your steps in regeneration in the inner cities? Yes, but the history is not quite as you put it. It's, you, what you have said is what people tend to believe but it's not the way it was. Um, I became Environment Secretary in 79, and I was appalled by the dereliction in the East End of London, where there was 6,000 acres, where the docks had gone, the public utilities had gone, all that had been built were council houses, and the emptiness and the dereliction. And the younger generation of families had left their parents behind, but they'd gone too, to the new towns and the suburbs. And so I began the process of regeneration using the concept of a new town corporation, called it an urban development corporation, took over responsibility for planning, land assembly, uh, and, and that public-private sector partnership. Uh, in 79, the, 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 there were technical reasons why you can't just do one place like London. It becomes what's known as hybrid legislation. So in order to overcome the hostility of my civil servants, I said, we'll take general powers. Where's the second worst place? And they said, Liverpool. I said, fine. We'll do a development corporation in Liverpool as well. I also did the garden festivals. You had one in, in Glasgow here. That was 1979 where we began it. And the third thing that happened in 79 is that Peter Shaw, the pre, my predecessor as a Labour um, cabinet minister, had created partnerships with the more uh, uh, impoverished areas of the country. And he put a minister in charge of trying to help these, these local authorities. He himself did Liverpool. I inherited that and kept it. And I moved a grant mechanism, which Peter Walker had created to get rid of the, uh, the um, coal tips and the ore and iron ore deposits in the countryside and green the fields. I took that grant mechanism into crea creating clean areas, greened areas out of derelict building sites. In 79, in 81, two years later, 
They rioted in Liverpool. And I went to Margaret and I said, look, there's a classic easy response, particularly on the right wing of politics. It's all the yobs on the streets. Back the police. And I said, look, I think this is more difficult. And I want to do something different. I want to take leave of absence effectively from my department and walk the streets of Liverpool, which I did. She agreed. Uh, and that was when I became, for the first time, I think, realistically, involved in really understanding how local government worked and how the mechanism of Whitehall, with its divisiveness and its separativeness, was not compatible with tackling the challenges of urban deprivation and social impoverishment. And I have to just explain, because this was so formative in my life. I, I've explained to you how I got there. I wanted to listen. We never listen. Politics never come. We don't care. We, all that stuff. You know what they say. So I turn up in Liverpool. Hello, Secretary of State. What are you doing here? Well, I've come to listen. I've, I'm shocked by the riots. I want to hear what's going on. I want to get under the skin of it all. Very good, Secretary of State. Day two, same arguments. Day three, same arguments. Around the streets, a lot of photographs. Day four, some journalists did what they always do. Secretary of State, you've been here now three or four days. Um, what are you doing now? And I realized that to go on saying, I'm listening. I couldn't get out of the city. If I'd stayed a week, I would have every journalist. So I began to, and I, and I realized something else. And many of you who understand politics and are interested will identify with this. Because there was one thing that everybody said when I listened to them. We know what's wrong, they said. You, him, her, them. What no one said is, I know what's wrong, and I want to do something about it. You'll all identify that phenomenon in life. Him, her, them, whatever. And so not only had I run out of arguments about listening, but I hadn't anything to put in its place. But I knew what was wrong. There was no one with any sense of leadership. So I thought, well, I better do something about it. And when I finished that immediate phase of three weeks, I had produced a list of 30 things that I thought could happen which would show that Liverpool had a future, that they could solve their own problems, that they could work together, they could create partnerships, that people locally could matter. And we produced the list, but of course, Producing the list in that climate, in that vacuum, nothing would have happened. So I thought, well, I better do something about it. And so I had the list. I created a team of public private sector officials and secondees. And every Thursday, I turned up for dinner. And every, I had a loose leaf page, 30 pages. I went through, every page was a scheme. I went through every one, every Thursday. What progress? Good. Not so good. Friday, I dealt with the not so goods. And then they went home again and back the next Thursday. And so I effectively was the clerk of works for the renaissance of one of Britain's great cities. And that's where the whole experience was born and how it was born. And the secretary of the cabinet, Robert Armstrong of the time, vividly described later, years later, he said, when you and your team came back, you were like people possessed, as though you'd suddenly seen some great light. It sounds all rather dramatic, this, but that's how we felt. It had we had become completely immersed in this incredible and vastly exciting challenge. Now, Mr. 
Mrs Thatcher and the Cabinet backed you in all this, but... Um, well, they didn't stop me, is the truth. <laughs> OK. No, they did, because I, I produced a report for them, and it was called It Took a Riot. And I, and, and I knew what I was doing when I chose that title. Right. Because that was the one thing everybody said. You're only here because it took a riot, didn't it? And they were right. It was why I was there. So I wrote the report, and I outlined what I thought should happen. Well, fortunately, as Secretary of State for the Department of the Environment, I had a huge budget, largely housing. So if you've got billions, which a housing budget amounts to, taking the odd million away from housing and spending it on a, a, renov a renovation scheme, whatever it is, um, it, it, it doesn't show and you can make much better use of the money. So I had, money was not my problem. The problem was to make things happen and give people the faith and, to, and actually to get others to do it because <laughs> my time was not going to be spent doing that. Um, so, so the cabinet gave me very little money, very little support, but fortunately the job I had was self-sustaining in that capacity and I was able to do it without outside support. You touched just there about the, uh, one of the divisions at that time within the Conservative Party and the Conservative Government. That was between the, the Thatcherites and what she called the wet. Um, did you regard yourself as a wet? Were you, you were no, regarded... I, I remember vividly, the, um, I was never on either side. My position uh, it, uh, then and ever since is this country over-consumes and under-invests. And uh, if I have a criticism, which I do, of the Thatcher philosophy, they, um, they had the incredible windfall of North Sea oil, and basically it was spent on consumer boom. And uh, one manifestation of that was the uh, mortgage interest tax relief, which has long since gone, which subsidized, in my view, house prices. I got rid of that. But in selling the council houses, what I also did was to get a commitment that three quarters of the money that came from the selling council houses would go into building new social houses. That lasted till I left to become defense secretary. But I also created, and this is hardly known, I recreated the private rented sector, which has made a huge social contribution to mobility and, and social housing. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I, 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 in some ways, my policy would have been less popular because I wanted the money to go into investment um, to create a sovereign wealth fund, for example. And too much of it went into the public uh, personal consumption. So at the time, I'm just, to, because as I say, trying to, to get to the roots of your, your fallout in the end with Margaret Thatcher as Prime Minister, you, you agreed with her on, on many policies, on privatisation, on, uh, on her attitude to the trade unions at the time and so on, but so was it was it more than a, just a clash of personal styles that you didn't like her impetuosity, you didn't like her sort of headmistress-like manner? No, yeah, I actually, I think, I think I privatised more of the public sector than any other Conservative minister. I think if you, if, obviously the council has sales, but there was the coal industry, the nuclear industry, the National Physical Laboratory, and a range of other things um, uh, that, that I, I privatised. I certainly led the opposition to... to one Labour proposal after another to nationalise something. The aircraft and shipbuilding nationalisation, which led to the Mace incident. Uh, I stopped the nationalisation of the ports. Um, so, so my credentials within the Conservative Party are alpha class when it comes to that. Uh, on the trade unions, I would have been and would remain completely supportive of what, they, what the Conservatives did in 1979, uh, the winter of discontent, which destroyed the Callaghan government, um, was the, the, the end of the, of the producer-dominating influence of the trade unions. And I happen to believe, just to throw it in, that the nationalisation of the commanding heights of the economy in the 1940s under Mr Attlee was one of the 
economic disasters of post-war Britain, because it took the commanding heights of our economy out of the competitive world and out of international competition and challenge. And that, that set back our economic recovery. So I am absolutely down the line, straight orthodox conservative on these dramatic issues. Um, on the European issue, which I think is where your question was heading. Well, I just really just to find out where you, where you because Europe came later, well, perhaps it, did, it was there all the time, but it's just still to get to the bottom of why you and Mrs. Thatcher didn't get on at all. Yes, well, well, you, you have to, you, you can't use the words don't get on at all. I've tried okay. to make this point that as colleagues, she, uh, well, I, I know she highly, she ranked me highly. I ran the departments in the way that she admired. I reduced public expenditure in, my, in the public employment in my department. I got rid of more quangos than Keith Joseph. So, I mean, I had all the street cred that would, that would be part of her approach to life. Um, but to understand the, um, uh, the, 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 the issue that led to my resignation, um, it was, it was a, it was a question of what is the right of a cabinet minister in a parliamentary democracy? So this, this is the Westland affair. I think, I think many of us will probably remember Westland, but just uh, for those who don't, because Westland was a helicopter company. Yes. And, and the, well, what, you had what, rival what, bids, American and European. Is yes. That right? What happened is that Westland, who is, which is Britain's only helicopter manufacturing company, was in financial trouble. And that is the responsibility of the Department of Trade and Industry. I was Defence Secretary, and most of the year in which the DTI was trying to grapple with uh, Westland's finances, I was negotiating what turned out to be the biggest international deal Britain ever did, which was the uh, German, Italian, Spanish, British Eurofighter deal. Um, a typhoon, it's called today, uh, which succeeded the tornado, which was a tripart idea. And I, cre I created that deal, which was hugely beneficial to British industry. And Leon Britton, who was Defence Secretary, asked if I would help with the Westland issue because I knew all the defense contractors of Europe who I'd negotiated this big deal with. And so I said, fine. And I went off to the defense industries of Europe and my political colleagues in Europe, and I said, look, there's a chance we can do something here. We've just done the Typhoon deal. And they agreed, and, and they came up, and I helped them with a deal which was led by GEC and British Aerospace and the four European countries. And they, they, they enabled me to go to colleagues and say, look, you can have a deal based upon a British and a European model. At the same time, UTC, um, uh, UTC Sikorsky, the American helicopter giant, were trying to sell to my department, the Defense Ministry, a helicopter called the Black Hawk. And all the briefing to me as Defense Secretary is, but we don't want this. It, the specification is wrong. We do not want the Black Hawk helicopter. So uh, first, I had no requirement for it. And secondly, I promised Leon to see what I could do. And I had a proposal endorsed by my three, four, defense secretaries of Europe. Margaret called a small meeting of ministers most involved, perfectly le legitimate means of government. And she was in favor of Sikorsky. She lost. Um, so she said, very well, we will call a meeting of the Economic Committee of the Cabinet. That is the biggest subcommittee of the Cabinet, and it's virtually the Cabinet. And she lost. And the conclusion of that meeting is that my proposal should be given a fair scrutiny. 
And she, in a rather intemperate conclusion of the meeting, she said, very well, we will meet again on Friday when the stock markets have closed and we will resolve this matter. And I was satisfied. Uh, I'd been given every chance by m my colleagues. My colleagues had supported me and it was going to cabinet. And that was the conclusion that I think it was a Friday, if I remember, that she, this, this meeting took place. The meeting for the final occasion was to be fixed and colleagues were notified and then it was cancelled. And so I raised the issue in Cabinet and she wouldn't let me. Now the choice that any of you would have to make and I had to make I had negotiated in good faith with my European defense ministers. I had got two major British contractors in the deal. And as defense secretary, defense secretary, I am being denied the opportunity, having won on two previous occasions with colleagues, to put the matter to colleagues in cabinet. And I won't go into the minutiae in detail, but that was the dilemma, and I, took the view then, I take the view now, that no self-respecting defence secretary could allow himself or herself to be so treated, that I could never have held any respect for, with any of my European colleagues again if I had allowed myself to have been humiliated in such a way. And don't have any illusions. The press briefing from number 10 would have been very simple. A man of straw made all this fuss, but actually it comes to it, he didn't really make a fuss at all. He just bowed down and went quietly. If you want to be defense secretary with that, represent that reputation, that's all right, but don't ask me to do that. And so I left. And it's always been a great sadness to me that I left. You walked out in the middle never, of the meeting. Uh, you? Yes, well, uh, well I, I, walked out in, I walked out in the middle of the meeting because, and this is getting into the detail, but it just compounds the problem. Margaret had a handbag here. <laughs> and, yeah. Prime Ministers, basically, are brilliantly briefed by the civil service. They know exactly what the arguments are in every department, and they will have summarized for the Prime Minister who was going to say what. And then they will say, and Prime Minister, there are probably three summings, conclusions that are available to you in the circumstances and uh, they will set them out. Uh, I can see it now. Margaret didn't stick with the three conclusions. She produced a scrappy piece of paper out of her handbag, and she read out the conclusion, which was that any, this, this conversation between the public debate has got to end, and any questions that are put about this to any member of the cabinet, but particularly Leon and Michael, must be referred to the cabinet secretary before they are answered. And I said, does that mean, Prime Minister, that if I am asked the same question that I was asked three days ago, and I answered in the terms I did, if I'm asked that same question tomorrow, by a journalist, I have to say, I'll let you know and ask for Robert Armstrong's guidance about an answer. Well, we have a very sophisticated press and everybody, anybody will know what would have happened. Number 10 would have said, he's bust. You go and ask the same question. And I'll tell you, he won't answer it because we've shut him up. Uh, so you're shut up and you haven't been allowed to put your case to cabinet. And when I heard that conclusion and her reply that it applies to questions you were asked yesterday as well as future questions, I said, I can't with honor stay in this cabinet. And that is my view in 1986. It is my view today. And uh, do I regret? Uh, well, I regret it hugely. Did I make the right judgment? I made the only judgment. 
Now, I'm conscious that I'm asking all the questions here, and so please do catch my eye, and I'll try and stop just looking at Michael so if you want to come in. Um, but this obviously went to a different period than in your career because you, you went to the back benches and you became, I think what we in, we in Scotland would call that the king across the water, referring to the Jacobite cause. So I you became know, the source. I know about the king across you the water. So you, you became the, uh, the, the focus for many who became either fed up or, or disenchanted with Mrs Thatcher. And I believe at this point, um, well, you can tell me whether or not were you, were you planning, plotting, even for future? Because at this point, you, I believe, it, sh it sounds Shakespearean, but I believe these words are yours. Uh, he who wields the dagger never wears the crown. I, I, those aren't found in my words. I'm very proud of them. I actually thought they were Shakespeare's, but, but, but uh, <laughs> I certainly used them. And I believed they were Shakespeare's, but now in the light of the history, people tell me that Shakespeare never did use those words. And so I stand up and be counted. They were mine. They're, they're used currently, of course, about another um, blonde-haired, charismatic politician who's trying to assassinate a prime minister. That is something I'd noticed. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, do you, I mean, you stood against, in the end, although you said this, you know, he who wields a dagger never wears a crown. In the end, you did stand against Mrs. Thatcher and, and brought about her resignation. I did. And um, the first time she was challenged was Anthony Mayer Anthony of uh, North Flint, one of the Flint seats, I think. I played no part in that. I kept well away from it. She should have seen the writing on the wall. But uh, I did nothing. Um, and then Geoffrey Howe resigned and made that momentous speech in the House of Commons. Uh, I was sitting just behind him when he did it. But now, Geoffrey was a very good friend of mine. And, um, but I knew nothing of his preparations, about his plans to resign or anything of that sort. Uh, but of course, he then ended with those words, which you can imagine the effect on me sitting just behind him, this electric atmosphere in the House of Commons. It is now for others to determine which way to take this matter forward. And I thought, oh my God. <laughs> um, curious enough, it's very interesting, that judgment was wrong. Geoffrey was not thinking of me. He was thinking of the cabinet. And I've, I believe this absolutely, and I was told by someone who was very close to Geoffrey that, that, so I misjudged that, but it doesn't matter, the public didn't, the, the journalists didn't misjudge it. They thought, this is, this is Heseltine, this is, the, this is the moment, what are you going to do? And uh, so I, 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 I well, I, after Geoffrey's speech, um, the house emptied, I went out with everybody else, and I passed Michael Jopling, who was another friend of mine, had been a chief whip, um, and I said, Michael, what the hell do I do now? And he said, you do nothing. You'll be leader of the opposition in 18 months. And I said, I don't want to be leader of the opposition. <laughs> and, you know, cometh the man, in a moment cometh the man. You have to stand up and be counted. Mm. Somebody, uh, you know, what would have happened, I don't know. But I, I do believe that the thing had got to the point where... Margaret was not going to win the next election. You've got to remember, I need to say this in Scotland, the poll tax had nearly destroyed the Tory party. Um, and I, when I was in 1979, flashback, uh, I, I had to find a replacement for the rates. And one of the options was a poll tax. And if we, the first thought makes the poll tax quite attractive. You know, we all pay, we all vote, we are responsible. Until you look at the detail. And it means that as someone with my background, my money, my gardeners pay the same as I do. And that's the end of the argument. Uh, so I persuaded the cabinet not to do the poll tax, and that was that. Uh, Margaret went back in after when I became defense they put Willie Whitelaw in to try and resurrect the poll tax. And um, he came to the same conclusion. And it wasn't until the rating revaluation in Scotland, I think about 1985, if I remember 86, something like that, that Margaret came up, came back with a poll tax in Scotland. And 
um, that was a disaster. It then became the poll tax in England. That was catastrophic. And uh, so by the time we got to 1990, I was involved in two things. Well, first of all was the, the European debate, and secondly, getting rid of the poll tax. And um, th 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 that basically was the platform on which I stood. Mm. Now, in that time, uh, I'm going to fast forward because what happened then, of course, was that you stood against Margaret, just Margaret Thatcher, just by herself, and won enough to take it to the second round. But John Major came in with Douglas Hurd and uh, eventually became prime minister. But he brought you back into cabinet, uh, and and David Cameron did too later on, in order to go back into government. But John Major immediately ran into difficulties over Europe. And there's a, a very interesting note right at the end of your book where you talk about um, advising John Major to try and reach a compromise with the Eurosceptics, in which you came up with a form of words promising a parliamentary, a, a referendum in the next parliament. And is that something you regret? Biggest mistake in my life, upon my political life. John, who was a very collegiate leader, and... Um, uh, he had a lot of trouble with the Eurosceptics, not on the same scale as today. I mean, I've forgotten what it, whether a dozen, nine, ten, something of that sort. Um, but, but they were a problem to him. And he was trying to find an accord. And he thought that the referendum, the promise of a referendum, would heal the uh, divide. He had... Uh, support for that, but Ken Clark and myself were implacably opposed. And um, I was Deputy Prime Minister by now. And it, John was raised the subject with us quite frequently, and we wouldn't move. And then one night, John invited us to his room in the Commons and raised the subject again. And I know exactly what I felt and what I thought. I was Deputy Prime Minister. He'd made me his deputy. And I saw my job then as to support him in any way I practically could. Um, and in order to do that, it was absolutely essential that we were like that. If the press could have found a glimmer of light between us, first of all, I would have had no authority because the moment it was there, people would know that they could go behind my back to him, and that would rapidly become the subject of journalists, and that this guy doesn't really matter. My colleagues, every time they didn't like something I said, would immediately say, well, we'll talk to the Prime Minister. So I was completely clear in my mind, as a Deputy Prime Minister, there would not be a glimmer of light between John and myself. So that if I said to a Cabinet colleague, I think we ought to do this or that. They would know, don't waste your time going to the Prime Minister. Heseltine's already been there. And um, so we're now back with the, with the, the um, referendum. And we were facing the issue of the euro, which was not on the agenda in John's government, period. There was no question of us deciding or not deciding. Indeed, we had decided not to decide. But, of course, the hypothesis existed. What about after the election? And this is where I made that terrible mistake. Motivated, I, no doubt, by my torn loyalties, hatred of the referendum, loyalty to John. And I remember saying in that meeting, John was there, Ken was there. Ken, I said, look, do you think that we could agree that we would say in the election campaign that in the event of us winning the election and in the event of us then wanting to join the Euro, there will be a referendum. And Ken said yes. And both of us believe it was the worst decision of our political life, and I believe that profoundly now. John made the announcement. All the qualifications were swept out of the window. European referendum. And from that moment on, the right wing had got the initiative. So that is how it happened. And um, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, which gives us a chance, because I, 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 I'll be honest with Brexit is dominating discussions in this parliament, and you know it's dominating discussions at Westminster. And I'm sure our audience would want to ask you questions about this, because uh, we are clearly in a dilemma. Uh, where do you see it? You, you, you believe you, you stepped down from these positions or you were let go from these government positions because you think there should be a meaningful vote. Do you, do you think that vote should be a vote in the, par in the House of Parliament or do you think it should be a referendum again, a second referendum? Well, on the, on the, I, when Theresa May sacked me, I voted for a meaningful vote in the House of Commons. Mm -hmm. Now she's already promised that, so mm -hmm. uh, she hasn't called me back, but there you are, that's life. Um, the, the, uh, um, uh, but I think it, certainly there needs to be a meaningful vote in the House of Commons, um, but there could be a situation where that doesn't lead to a conclusion or to a negative conclusion. Um, and so I, I believe that, the, and I believe this from day one after the referendum, and when I said it at the time in print, we either need a general election or we need another referendum. Uh, I believe the people were conned. I believe that the, the, the case for the referendum was built on lies. And I think the public opinion is changing. Uh, but at the moment, nobody knows what leaving means. There's no, there's no use asking anybody, because nobody knows. I read in the newspapers uh, 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 tonight that we may see a deal on uh, Wednesday. Um, the cabinet is going to be told on Tuesday. I don't know if it's true or not, but this is what's all over the news now today. But So what you learn from that is that no one knows, because the deal hasn't yet been agreed, the cabinet hasn't been told, and uh, what you do know is there's a sporting chance that if the Europeans like it, 40 or 50 Conservative MPs will vote against it. So what does Brexit mean? And I don't know what it means, except that Britain is leaving the top table of European po politics. That's really my preoccupation, that it's our single market, it is our home base, it is where our power over centuries has lied, and we are not going to be there. So who talks for Europe? Well, it will be the German Chancellor. And I have used the words, they lost the war and they won the peace, and I can't live with that as a British politician. I think you've said recently as well that it, in, in a choice between the lesser of two evils, Brexit versus a Jeremy Corbyn-led government, you actually think that Brexit is the worst option for somebody who's campaigned against Labour politics all your life. Uh, uh, this is the nightmare question, yeah. you know. <laughs> no, it, it, is, it is the nightmare question. And I have a cop-out, a cop-out. I don't have a vote. And that's the most dishonest answer. Because, of course, I may not have a vote, but do I have an opinion? And there isn't any doubt whatsoever that Brexit is a long-term calamitous disaster for this country. Jeremy Corbyn is a short-term calamitous <laughs> dilemma. Now, we've got... Can I, uh, Put your hand up here. I'm going to turn. We've got Facebook Live, so I've got some questions coming up here. But if you want to participate, you're the live audience. You've actually paid your money to come in here, so <laughs> put your money, your hand up. Can I just ask you, by the way, because I was mentioning Boris Johnson earlier. I mean, Boris Johnson actually took in, inherited your seat in Henley with your endorsement. Not with my endorsement. I wasn't consulted, but I, I'm not. I, I, you, you, you supposed I, to let me say it once. I'm not. Uh, in any way critical of John uh, 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 Boris as member of parliament for Henley or as mayor of London. And I like Boris. Mm. He makes me laugh. <laughs> well, don't underestimate that. That is Boris's secret. He makes everybody laugh. Um, but but let's. He won London twice. That was him. He is. He was a bigger figure than the Conservative Party. Now. You now move on, for reasons which I, I'm afraid I found dubious, he threw himself into the leadership of the Brexit campaign. I think that was personal ambition, I think it was opportunist, and I, I could never condone it. But, you know, I'm not, I don't find it necessary to hate my political opponents. Indeed, I would say, and it's self-evident, I mean, one of the most 
emotional moments of my life is when the Labour mayor of Liverpool offered me the freedomship of the city. And there, <laughs> there isn't a Tory councillor, I mean, you know. But I, I, I spend most of, a lot of my political life working with my opponents in urban regeneration. And politics doesn't hardly ever come to us. We, we're there to try and do something to solve the people's problems in these rather difficult urban problems. And, and so I don't find it necessary to, to hate people who disagree with me. Last night, Anne and I were with a friend of mine, Jeremy Isaacs, uh, who commemorating another friend of mine, uh, Anthony Howard. Um, they were both Labour cha chairman of the Oxford University Labour Club when, when we were at Oxford together. Uh, and we were celebrating that, that event last night. So, uh, you know, the, the Labour MPs I don't like, I have to say it with some hesitation, there have been occasional Conservative MPs I don't like. <laughs> but on balance, I like them all. I don't want to ask a personal question about the Prime Minister, Theresa May, but do you think that she is in a position to take us through this um, Brexit issue at the moment? Well, she's in a position to do it. Technically, I have to say yes to that um, because she is Prime Minister. Whether she can, if, if, if your technical question means has she got the majority, very probably not. What they tell me is that, there, I saw it in one of the papers, I think, that 30 Labour MPs are going to vote with a Conservative government to push this through. Well, I'll believe it when I see it. It's not the way oppositions behave. Oppositions go for the jugular, and uh, uh, I, I should be very interested to see which 30 Labour MPs are prepared to say to their uh, constituency activists, look, we could have done this, beaten the government, we could have had, as they will see it, an election and all that sort of stuff, but we'd rather keep the Tories in power. Uh, well, maybe that's what's going to happen, but it's not what uh, I'd be backing, betting on if it was my money. But isn't that isn't the issue that party loyalties are getting in the way of resolving Brexit? But, the, but the, 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 that, is, that is politics. You know, the, I mean, I, the, the, the majority of Tory MPs in the House of Commons today are against Brexit. They have campaigned for every prime minister in my memory who advised that Britain's self-interest depending upon our European sovereignty sharing. But they have to weigh their careers, their constituency activists, their party, above all else. Now, I tell you, I have a very simple... I have only three times I have defied my party over a three-line whip. A over race relations in the 1960s, two over the poll tax in the 1980s, and three over Article 50, Article 50 and the decision to leave Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, my answer is very simple. In the end, if you're in politics, you have to decide why. And I'm in politics because I believe that my country's self-interest, as I interpret it, is bigger than my party. And so if I'm going to respect my own integrity and my own commitment to this country, which obviously I feel strongly about, in the end, I cannot put my party's interests above the nation's interests. And every Conservative MP is going to have to weigh those decisions. I don't want to obsess with personality politics, but it's coming up on Facebook as well. And I've got two questions from Tom and Jill earlier, although my screen's now gone dead. And that's a totally different subject. They've asked you about Scottish independence and about our First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. So what well, you you, you'd either? be a brave man to venture into Scottish politics, um, <laughs> um, about which I cannot profess to be in any way a, an expert. Um, and, and I, I'm not much given to the sort of personalities. Um, uh, you know, Nicola Sturgeon is first minister of this important country, and she's democratically elected, and, and I have to respect that. Uh, I have no reason at all to think I wouldn't have a perfectly good personal relationship if I met her, but I don't think I have. Um, 
but she is, to me, on the left of politics, and I doubt very much if we would uh, find much to agree about. Um, Not independence. I am appalled by the prospect of the fracturing of the United Kingdom, which is a sort of mini fracturing of Brexit. It is the same argument. And um, we are, uh, I mean, <laughs> I don't want to get tear jerking about this, but if I look at the record of the British Empire and the British Commonwealth and the incredible strengths which Scotland has contributed to this two, three hundred year human achievement, the idea of fracturing it, I find unbelievable. Great entrepreneurs, great engineers, great scientists, great politicians. Um, no, it's, it's just unthinkable. There is one thing, and again, I'm with great hesitancy do I say this. If I have one question I would ask about, quotes, independence, is this really substituting Edinburgh for Whitehall? And substituting Edinburgh for Whitehall with the, the centralism sort of moved a few hundred miles north, will that really change anything very much in Scotland? The report that I wrote, the, re the report that I wrote called No Stone Unturned, dealt with this issue in an English context. And what I have been arguing for, for many years now, is the recreation of the power centres of the 18th century. And if I was looking at the Scottish economy in that context, I would be asking myself about Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Dundee, and whether they are being devolved power to, whether they are being recreated as the dynamics that they were when those cities were at their heyday. And if you ask that question about England, then you will see the mayoral authorities which we are now creating. And to me, the thing that has done a great deal to undermine the strength of this country is the functional divisions of Whitehall. And in, my question is, are the functional divisions now replicated in Edinburgh? But the ministerial careers, the official careers, the fragmentation of power and decision-making means that nobody is looking at the place. They're looking at housing at education, at roads, at industrial policy, at defence, health, whatever it may be. And this, uh, I take it to the most deprived estates. Some of those estates I saw for the first time close to in Liverpool. Huge sums of money spent on the most deprived communities. Big money, big budgets. And there'll be a health worker and there'll be a policeman, and there'll be a, a teacher, and there will be an employment person, and there will be social workers, and there will be this and there'll that. And the interesting thing is two things. They never meet. And no one ever talks to the tenants about whether the money could be better spent. Well, turn that into the local economy, which is the dynamic aggregated into the nation. And who's actually responsible for the dynamic of the components of the Scottish economy? That, these would be the questions to which I sought answers. But if you think it can be done by someone in Edinburgh concentrating on the functional divisions of government, I disagree. It never was done like that. It was done by communities of men and women, self-motivated, self-interested, locally, aware, in touch, not by great bureaucracies sending down conformist patterns of behavior relevant to a compromise they've worked out centrally and implying it, imposing it on different economies. The good news is you've animated some questions now from the audience, so I think I just saw a hand come up here. 
It just, I think, yes, I think maybe the microphone will come on, so I just try and project. Yes, it has come on. Could I ask your observation, which I'm thankful for your talk, um, on what I call the Gina Miller case in Article 50, and also um, on the role of MPs having substantial earnings from second jobs, and one thinks about journalistic earnings, um, and the role of IPSA in all of that, and IPSA having a board which seems totally confined within the M25. Two, two different questions. The first one about the Gina Miller case, the Article 50 case, and the Gina Miller uh, court case. Which yes, she, court. she was the lady who took on, challenged the... And won, yeah. yes. yes. And, and the second one being um, the journalists, uh, the, the idea the, the, of outside the, income. The, and the, the second one I understand fully well. Well, the Gina Miller case, I think, I mean, was... Uh, a perfectly legitimate uh, uh, activity from a courageous lady, and she won, and uh, I salute the endeavor. Of course, I'm on her side. You won't be surprised I said that. Uh, outside income, absolutely essential. It is very important that politicians represent the nation. And if you say we are going to have a professional politician limited to what they can earn as a member of parliament, you are by definition excluding entrepreneurs. Now, you may not like entrepreneurs, and not all of them are likable, but the experience they bring is an essential ingredient in the management of a complex economy. And if you don't allow people to earn what they can legitimately earn, you will exclude a certain attitude, a certain experience, and that would be a pity. So it's a choice. You, if you want people, I mean, what do members of parliament get today? About 70,000 a year, something of that sort. Uh, okay, now I've, that's a lot more than the average earnings, and a, a lot of people are entitled to say, well, it's more than I get, and then why should they, and all that sort of stuff. And I understand all of that, the human resentments and the human envy and all that, but if you want to limit your representation to people who can not who can only earn 70,000 a year, you are making a decision to exclude a certain talent pool, and I think you do so to your own disadvantage. Another question just over here, the gentleman here. Yes. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Lord Herschel Weinberg. What was indeed a very fascinating, if undoubtedly quite brief, uh, sort of run through a, a long and varied sort of career. Um, I, I, I've got one very short but slightly mischievous question. Today we live our lives through the prism of social media and Twitter and even right now every word and everything that we're, what we're looking at has been recorded live and going out through the internet. Is there anything left that we don't yet know about those frantic weeks round about uh, late 1990, about the leadership challenge and Mrs Thatcher's demise that hasn't really come out? And I appreciate there may well be people alive today that you don't want to compromise, but I just wonder how much more there is still to know about that period. Yes, basically saying that, do we know all that we could know about the leadership challenge of 1990? Because these days politics is played out in the public domain fully, but in 1990 perhaps it still wasn't. And are there, are there things you know about the, the plotting and machinations behind the scenes that we don't know about, uh, or has it all now been published? I, I think it's all in the public domain. I mean, perhaps I don't know. Um, <laughs> but but I, I, to the best of my knowledge, it's all been covered pretty in considerable detail. At the time, you were, you were the victim several times. I mean, I don't want to get into personality politics again, but with, you were actually on the receiving end of number 10 briefings. Bernard Dingham, I think he called one of your colleagues, John Biffin, semi-detached. But I think you were the first one to be called not uh, one of us. Th Sorry. This was, this was um, Westland. Uh, well, bef well if, before if you Westland. Asked, if your question had been... No, this is the leadership, but yeah. in general, under the Thatcher administration, the number 10 machine was briefing against you. I mean, you were described as not one of us. Uh, well, I certainly wasn't. So, I mean, that's <laughs> no problem at all to me. Um, uh, but I was not on the wet side. I was in my own middle ground, as we've covered. But, if, but, but well, I don't think there's anything new that come, will come out of the, um, uh, the, the challenge in 1990. 
the Westland affair, that certainly uh, has been, uh, there was a criminal conspiracy to support Sikorsky. There's no question about it. It was never investigated by the police and um, there, there is more to come. There's no doubt. Right. Yes, gentlemen there. If you were Prime Minister today, how would you deal with the two appalling presidents in Washington and Moscow? Mm. Uh, Washington. So what do, you, what do you make of President Trump and what do you make of President Putin? <laughs> uh, well, I, I don't empathise with Mr. Trump. Um, I, I don't have a high regard for him. I don't like his methods. I don't like his policy. He happens to be president of the most important nation and uh, 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 an important ally of this country. And uh, I would not see my job as prime minister to go around uh, alienating a relationship which has to be maintained and uh, if fractured, restored. So care would be, but I hope, there's only one prime minister that has stood up to an American effectively since the war, Harold Wilson over Vietnam. So, you, you know, if you have any sense of history, you will understand what you're saying if you say, I'm going to stand up and defy an American president. Maybe, but you've got to know what you're doing. So, th so this is, you're hearing a real politic answer. I'm not prepared to say that I would be in the business of, you know, confronting an American president. I've been looking for ways of finding my way through, which is what most British prime ministers do. Mr. Putin, well, I have, I have a, look, his behavior over the uh, Novichok poisoning is wholly unacceptable. It is black and white, end of story, so to speak. His, the, the GRU has been turned into a world laughing stock over the last few days, over the Salisbury tourists, who now, this poor lady, the grandmother, who's identified one of them as a major in the GRU, um, when the Russians have been trying to dismiss it all. I mean, this is humiliation for the Russians. And, and so one must be appalled by that. And now there's talk about the Dutch exploits. So you, you, you've got a very difficult and, and pretty black and white situation you're dealing with. I have to say that in my look ahead at the world that most of you will inhabit, I think we've got more in common with the Russians than against them. It depends where you think the big trigger points of the world are. I don't believe that they are the Russian tanks moving west. The Russians have moved their tanks a long way east since the closure, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. They'll fiddle around with marginal threats and this sort of thing. But it seems to me, A, they can't afford it, and B, they've readjusted to the motherland and to Russia as the pride of their nationalist instincts. Um, but there was Hitler and there was Napoleon. And they'll never forget that. Huge Western armies. They've got China on the other side. Well, they're getting on a bit better now, but it's not always been like that. But here, the soft underbelly, they have got the Muslim-dominated republics. And then you've got Israel. Now, to me, that's the focus of the worst dangers for the next half century. I'm not going to predict how or where or why, but that's the, where the instability is. 
That's where the, uh, the dangers are to me. And I think that is the same danger that infects Russia as much as it does us. And so I, I think British foreign policy should be trying to build bridges to Russia. Now, that doesn't mean you accept or give in their right to come and do the terrible things they've done. But you, you ask the long-term view. Um, and, you know, the Ukraine, the Crimea, that really is Russian territory. They haven't put their troops into the Ukraine, which they could have done. They could have taken the Ukraine. They'd have been mad, but they haven't and I don't think they will. Um, I think Yeltsin should never have done what he did to, uh, with the Ukraine. So um, I, I would, my, my long-term strategic objective, if I was in that position, which <laughs> you all know I'm not, would be to build bridges with the Russians. Now, I was going to take another question, but I'm afraid... We've just run out of time now, so it's, yeah. So that's always the way. Everyone warms up and has the questions. But uh, we're going to be moving down shortly uh, to the garden lobby. Maybe we'll have a chance then. Uh, I'm just going to ask one last question. Just uh, then, you, you, you revealed uh, in your book that you were diagnosed quite late in life with uh, as a dyslexic, but you seem to have written an awful lot of books for someone <laughs> with dyslexia. Do you have any any plans for any more? Yes, I, I'm working on a book called. Ride the fastest snail. <laughs> I, I, I said at the very beginning there were two sorts of people in life. We, we had the, the entrenchers and the adventurers. But my observation, if, if, uh, if you were even younger than you are and you were asking for my advice about how to succeed, you know, I would say to you, well, Ride the fastest snail. Don't be up front, but always be there. You know, when the crunch comes, when the moment comes, don't be the guy, the focal of attention. Be the guy standing behind. Don't take the flack. <laughs> don't be the one they're all criticizing. Be the one with the constructive suggestion as how to build bridges, how to unite together. Be there. Ride the fastest snail. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. So you, you've beaten me to it there, but I want to, to thank you, Lord Hesler, and I want to thank you particularly all for coming in to uh, join us this evening, and I hope you will continue to join us in the garden lobby for actually what is the official launch of the Festival of Politics, and we've got several events coming up. We've got Dame Margaret Hodge coming to join us, uh, Sir Tom Devine, uh, the Booker Award-winning novelist Ben Ockrey, and many more. So I, I hope... Uh, but most of all, it requires your participation, and hopefully you'll have a chance to ask the questions that you didn't get now. But I'd like to end this part by asking you to join me in thanking Lord Michael Heseltine for joining us this evening. Thank you.